Hey guys, so while I was making the three bot documentaries, I spent a lot of time just watching bots fight. It wasn't fun, but over time I started to gain an understanding of just how the bots in TF2 work. I remember thinking, when I first started playing TF2, that bots were this incredible feat of programming, and my mind couldn't comprehend that such a thing was possible. I realise now that they're not quite as smart as I gave them credit for. The bots, while they can technically be described as an artificial intelligence, I'd have to say they're anything but intelligent. You see, the way I believe the bots in TFT work is that they have a main goal and they react to what's around them as they work towards this main goal. For example, their main goal might be to defend a point. As they do this, an enemy team member may appear, which the bots then react to by shooting at them. After they have reacted, they return to their main goal and the process repeats. While still smart, this comes nowhere close to the world of semi-sentient artificial intelligence that I had originally imagined. But artificial intelligence is still a very interesting topic. And so because of this, I thought I might go through each bot documentary and basically explain what I think is going on. So let's get started. Here we are on CP Dust Bowl. This first scene is pretty much a perfect example of the goal and reaction system I explained earlier. The blue team's goal is to walk to the point, and when they see the red team, they attack them. On the red team, the engineers have put down sentries. Building sentries in setup time is something you'd probably expect from both bots and real life players, but notice how they've also built dispensers in similar places in relation to their sentries. This indicates that building a dispenser after placing their sentry is probably in their code. Moving on, we have this very interesting confrontation. The blue team uses an uber to push forward onto the point, and the red team counter pops their uber, leaving the two parties in a stalemate. First of all, you might think that the red medic sees the enemy uber, and because of this, he uses his own uber, but it's more likely that he used it because he took damage. According to the TF2 wiki, if a medic bot takes damage, it will immediately use its uber if it has one. Secondly, you'll notice that most of the red team runs away at the sight of the enemy uber, but the ubered soldier stays where he is. This implies that the bots are programmed not to retreat whilst invincible. This is backed up by the fact that the heavy immediately runs away when the uber runs out, and that he doesn't retreat before this even though it's clear his uber will end first. Last of all, the two parties don't look for any other targets to attack. This backs up the idea of a main goal. The blue team has to capture the point and the red team has to defend it, which results in a stalemate. They don't leave because they don't have any other objectives. If there were other players in the area, the bots would probably switch targets and shoot them instead. But since there aren't any, the bots remain still until the blue team's uber ends. In the next section we once again see some engineers. In the original video I comment on how the engineer refuses to repair his sentry. I thought there might be a reason for this, but no, apparently sometimes engineers just won't repair their sentries. However, when a spy places a sapper on his sentry, an engineer does seem to react. He completely ignores the other sentry though, which could mean that engineers have no or limited awareness of other engineers' buildings. Although it could also be because, as stated earlier, they refuse to repair sentries. Here we see the blue engineer. In Attack Defend, engineer bots are programmed to set up and defend at the first control point, and this is a typical example of such. Notice how he's placed a dispenser close to him, and not in an area that would be useful for his team. Back at the second control point, we see a large group of red players standing in one place. This probably occurs because they've been programmed to defend a point, but the space available is very small, so they're all bunched into one area. Moving on to our next map, I'm not sure much explanation is needed here. The bot's coding tells them to go to the control point, and they expect there to be bridges connecting it to the rest of the map. Unfortunately, the bridges don't extend until later, so all of the bots essentially commit suicide, falling to their deaths. This shows that bots have no way of telling if there is a cliff in front of them. For bots to work, a map requires a navigation mesh, which basically tells the bots where they can and can't go. The bots will follow this mesh blindly, so if the mesh is wrong or inaccurate, you can be left with disastrous, albeit humorous results. Next up we have PL Upward, where an engineer is waiting to place a building. Most likely this is a teleporter entrance, and it's likely that this is one of the top priorities of an attacking engineer. Outside, these demo men are placing down some stickers. Most likely, demo men are programmed to place stickers on objectives, like payloads and control points, and detonate them when enemy bots walk by. This strategy is fairly effective, because bots don't seem to be able to see sticky bombs. Either that, or their desire to play the objective nullifies all other concerns. Here we see that bots don't understand that not everyone has to push the payload. It's very likely that on a payload map, a bot's main goal is to push the objective. Except for probably snipers and spies, the bots just aren't smart enough to run ahead and fight the enemy, leaving just a few to push. 
However, having everyone on the cart seems to work well enough for the bots, and they soon capture the first point, which brings us to this strange scene. I honestly have no idea why the spy wouldn't sap this dispenser, however, he is clearly focused on it, and even though he for whatever reason cannot attack it, he refuses to move on. That is, until the building is destroyed and the spy instantly starts moving again. This seems to imply that bots become focused on a single task, and won't deviate from that task until it is complete. Overall, this is a very confusing series of events, and what makes it weirder is how the spy goes on to sap a sentry and a dispenser with no problems at all. Moving on, we have this iconic moment. The cliff scene. This is very similar to the nucleus death scene, but there are still a couple of things I'd like to address. Navigation meshes can be created in two ways. Either they are drawn manually, or they are generated automatically by a computer. In this scene, the bots walk off the cliff, which could have two different reasons. Either the navigation mesh has been drawn really poorly, or a mistake has been made when generating it. When you look at the cliff, the side of it curves, and you can technically walk on this surface, which may cause the game to mark it as a place a bot can go. This isn't great for the bots, for as we already know, the bots cannot detect where cliffs are, nor can they react to them. Therefore, since their only choice is to follow the nav mesh, there is a high bot fatality rate in this area. I think the rest of the upward section is pretty self-explanatory, so let's return to Dust Bowl. This is probably going to be the most difficult part to explain, and to be perfectly honest, I don't really know what causes the bots to act like this. First of all, a sniper attempts to leave his spawn, but the door doesn't open for him. I have no idea why this happened, and if anyone could help in the comments, that would be great. The only thing I can suggest is that the gates won't open for the first couple of seconds of a round, but I've never experienced this in a game, and bear in mind this was before Meet Your Match, so doors staying closed at the beginning of a round hadn't been introduced yet. As confusing as this may be, the next point is significantly easier to explain. The engineer is trying to get back into the previous area to defend the control point, but alas, he cannot. This spy, however, is infinitely more difficult to understand. I don't know why he's standing in the corner, but running into corners is something bots do a lot, and they do it particularly often with this corner. Once again, if anyone could offer their ideas in the comments, it would be greatly appreciated. Let's move on to something I might actually be able to explain. Every now and then, these engineers will run to the teleporter entrance at spawn. One of the engineers will get there first and take it, and the other will run back to his sentry nest. It's probably in the bot's programming that if they're near a teleporter entrance, they'll attempt to travel through it. The engineers here are probably within the radius of effect, so they'll take it whenever it's available. Bots are also probably programmed to not queue, meaning that they won't wait for a teleporter to charge. This explains why the engineer that reached the teleporter second doesn't wait, and instead goes back to his sentry. Our journey is coming to an end, but first we must analyse King of the Hill Sawmill. The main focus here is how the bots run into the giant circular saws. As I've mentioned earlier, to the bots, the nav mesh is law, and if the nav mesh says they can go somewhere, they will not question it. Unfortunately, cliffs aren't the only hazard present in the Badlands, and just like the cliffs, the bots cannot detect moving circular saws either. The final thing I need to address is why the bots all stood in the corner on Dust Bowl. When Sin from NISLT first requested that I make an extended version of Bots a documentary, he sent me a picture of a group of bots that had glitched on Dust Bowl, and asked that I feature this in the new documentary. I agreed, but no matter how many times I watched the bots play, the glitch wouldn't repeat itself. So, I started trying methods to force the bots to do, well, anything. And eventually, I found that if I went ahead of the bots and capped the point before they got there, they'd get confused and just stand in the corner for the rest of the match. It wasn't the same corner as the one Sin showed me, but it was good enough. And that was the last point I wanted to cover. I hope you enjoyed this analysis of Bots A Documentary. If you did, consider leaving a like, and if you want an analysis of Bots A Sequel, then please subscribe so you don't miss out. That's all for now. Goodbye. This meme will never die, because we are in the beam. Be